Hang on. All right, here All right. we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm continuing the study of Christian creeds. Uh, tonight, we'll look at the Athanasian Creed. Uh, we've already studied the uh, Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed of 325 A.D., the revised Nicene Creed uh, in Constantinople in 381 A.D. We looked at the Chalcedonian Creed and now the Athanasian Creed. We've got, um, after this, I think I'll do, look at the Westminster Confession, even though it's voluminous, it's really large. I'm not going to try to go through the whole thing, but I just want to uh, cover some basics on it. And then we'll look at the Council of Trent, which is basically the Roman Catholic's answer to the Reformation. Uh, and then we'll, so, so that's how I see this, and uh, then we'll finish this subject of creeds, uh, even though there's probably about a hundred other creeds we could look at that are not as, that are minor creeds. Um, before we get started, let me ask uh, Brother Stephen to say hi, introduce yourself. Uh, hey, everybody, once again, it's Brother Stephen, you know, known as Stephen Rivers TV, you know, here on YouTube. As I always say, looking forward to another night of fellowship. You know, this time, you know, learning about, you know, the Athos, this creed, and then, of course, sharing the gospel. Looking forward to sharing that with you in about 55 or so minutes. All right. Um, before we get started, though, I want to bring something to everyone's attention and, and beg you for prayers. Um, Brother Evan Phillips. Uh, known on YouTube as Nephilim Free, and his wife Sharon are going through probably the most difficult ordeal of their lives right now. Uh, so I, I just want, please, everybody, they, they really need your prayers. And um, please keep them in your constant prayers. All right, now let's look at the Athanasian Creed. I'm going to give you, before we actually read the creed, just a slight bit of history on this. It says the, the Athanasian Creed, or quick unc volt, as it said, I guess that's in Latin or Greek, I don't know. It, it's a Christian statement of belief focused on Trinitarian doctrine and Christology. Um, that's the Latin name is quick unc volt, is taken from the opening words, whosoever wishes. Um, the creed has been used by Christian churches since the sixth century. It is the first creed in which the equality of the three persons of the Trinity is explicitly stated. It differs, differs from the Nicene Constantinople Creed and the Apostles Creeds in the inclusion of anathemas or condemnations of those who disagree with the creed. <clears throat> it's like the, in that way, it's like the original Nicene Creed. Um, uh, yeah, it uh, really was written to as an answer to um, Arianism that we've we've discussed that quite a few times. But Arianism is uh, a false teaching that entered in the first few centuries of the church. The 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 the, the philosophy that uh, Jesus is not eternal, but he did have a beginning, and therefore he is a creature. Uh, so. Um, uh, a lot of these count church councils and and, and the, the, what came out of the councils were these creeds. They were in response to this uh, uh, false teaching of Arianism. On one extreme, they had Arianism saying that Jesus is a creature. And then on the far end of the extreme, it said that uh, it, it, it so wanted to, to defend monotheism uh, and and not let anybody think that we believe in three gods, three separate gods, that they went to the other extreme, and, and uh, it was uh, Sabellianism or modalism, saying that there's one God, he just wears three masks, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so these are the two extremes, and that's why all these church councils came about. In the beginning, they were trying to really focusing on the... Uh, who is Jesus? Who is the Father? How are they relate, related? And, and it was that's called Christology. 
Uh, and then now as we get through these other creeds and we get to the Athanasian creed, now they're focusing on the same thing they did with, with Jesus, uh, establishing his deity and that he's the same substance as the father, uh, but a distinct person. Now they're, uh, they're uh, answering the same question regarding the Holy Spirit in the Athanasian creed. <clears throat> uh, let me just get your reaction to what I've said so far, brother. Yeah, a lot of these creeds that we've covered, I mean, I haven't been here for the last two of them, but a lot of them really did touch on the divinity of Christ, which is, you know, a very important you know, subject. But then again, there was a lot of these things. Like, there was the one you mentioned, you know, about him not being eternal. Then, of course, there's, like, modalism beliefs. Then, of course, there's also the belief that um, he never had, like, a physical, that he was never had a physical body. So there was a lot of this, you know, these things going around. And so there was like these creeds that were established to, you know, like cover this stuff to just, you know, determine, you know, orthodox, you know, versus, you know, heresy, I guess, like for these movements. And that's all that I'm really thinking of on this right now. But what do you have to say? Yeah, I think that was a good uh, addition. You, you said that, uh, what about Jesus's humanity? That's another, that's another issue that had to be resolved in these creeds. And uh, there, there were docetists and uh, uh, Gnostics that, that were teaching that Jesus never did come in the flesh. And that's why the Apostle Paul argues that in, uh, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians and I think John, in 1 John, uh, the, he talks about the idea that if anybody says that Christ has not come in the flesh is, is uh, 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 anathema. But so these, this creed, I believe, the, uh, the Athanasian creed addresses not only the, the, uh, 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 the person of the Holy Spirit, um, but it, but also I do believe it does address the humanity of Jesus. So let's let's uh, take a look at it now. Let me see. Uh, okay, it says, "Whosoever will be saved, before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith." Well, let me stop right there and see if you have anything to say about that opening statement. Well, I guess, I mean, I've already mentioned this. Like, the Roman Catholics, I don't believe, were around at that time. But I, I, I guess, you know, when it comes to this, they're talking about, like, their Orthodox, you know, faith that they have at the time. But um, a lot of these creeds that we've had do not really go into the specifics about how to be saved. Well, at least the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, when I was here for those, didn't do that. But I'm not quite so sure for the last one. But... That's pretty much what I'm thinking about. Like, it's upholding, I guess, to orthodoxy is what I would say it's saying in this one. Yeah. Um, see, most people today, when they hear the word Catholic, uh, they automatically connect it to Roman Catholicism. Um, Roman Catholicism really wasn't established, and it, it can be debated uh, as to what is the real origin of Roman Catholicism. Um, some people think that it would be when Constantine legalized uh, Christianity in the Roman Empire. And, and after that, uh, particularly when uh, uh, what was the following emperor after Constantine, he not only legalized it, but he, he declared that uh, Christianity was the, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And when those things happened, uh, the, the Roman um, people who had a long history of believing in polytheism and many gods, they brought in a lot of their paganism and mixed it in. And, uh, and that's why you see in Roman Catholicism so much that we could say that's, that came from paganism. Uh, and yet, even before Constantine, I can still see some of the errors of Roman Catholicism, even in the, in the second, third, fourth centuries, uh, be, even before Constantine, uh, like, the idea of baptismal regeneration, you're saved when you get baptized, and like the idea that you must take sacrament, sacraments to continue to be saved. Um, 
these ideas are, are, did not wait until the, the, the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries. Uh, I, we can see them early. I think in this creed here, we'll see some references to that. But a lot of people defend the use of the word Catholic because um, it, it originally meant, it translates to universal. And just as uh, Brother Stephen, you, you and I would use the term the church, we, when we say the church, we think the church is not an organization. Uh, it's not some hierarchy of clergy and laity. Uh, it, it, it is, it's not a, uh, uh, a building. A, a church, the, the church is, uh, not, as I said, not an organization, but rather an organism is an interesting way of expressing it. An organism made up of many cells, and each cell would be each believer. So, uh, Brother Stephen, uh, you're part of the church. I'm part of the church. All those who put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation and trust him alone, uh, they are part of this church. Um, so the, the word universal, we would just use the word church. The word Catholic, we don't use that. We use the word church. Or another term that would be correct to use would be the body of Christ. The church and the body of Christ should be interchangeable terms. Um, but the problem is, if we did use refer to ourselves as Catholic, uh, it technically would be okay. But I, I, I won't associate with it because... Uh, people may get the impression that we are uh, identifying as part of the Roman Catholic Catholic religion, which is really, a, a, sadly, it's, it's the largest cult in the world. If you want to see all my complaints against Roman Catholicism, you should watch my playlist, um, uh, Roman Catholicism Debunked. Uh, okay, brother, what's your response to that? I like that you, you know, brought in the words, you know, body of Christ when it comes to, you know, like, you know, the true church, because, you know, that's what we are. You know, a lot of churches like, you know, the Catholic Church or, you know, any, you know, probably cult or denomination might try to claim that, you know, they're the one true church. I'm not pointing at anyone in you know, particular, but, you know, the true church, you know, the true, which is, you know, the true body of Christ is those who have put their faith and trust, you know, in Jesus alone. You know, they are the ones, you know, who are the real, you know, members, you know, of the body of Christ. And, of course, you know, once you're in the body of Christ, you cannot, you know, get out of it, you know, no matter what happens. You know, that's the greatest part. But, yeah, there's just a lot of, I guess, denominations that like to claim, you know, like, you know, about like church membership and stuff like that, make putting you in like the church. When in reality, it's all about, you know, faith and trust in Jesus. Okay, uh, let me continue reading. That was just the first line. And uh, so it says, um, and then it continues, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled. Um, I, I'm going to read the first sentence again. It says, whosoever will be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. So this is saying that before anything else regarding salvation, you must hold to the Catholic faith. So that's the de de declaration right off the bat. You must believe this in order to be saved. This is explaining to us, this creed is explaining to us what this Catholic faith, um, the tenets are. And then it says, which, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled. So you must believe this completely, everything in this uh, uh, creed. Without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. Uh, and then it's going to go on and say what the faith is. But uh, what do you think of that sec second sentence there? Which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled? Without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. Well, I mean, most of these creeds that we've seen, you know, don't talk about, you know, believing on Jesus as the means to salvation, or at least not the early ones. So, I mean, we haven't gotten to, you know, that part of this creed yet. But it's talking about, you know, like their specific faith, like of it's like, I guess, how like the Catholic, like the Roman Catholics would say that they're the true church, you know, and that you have to be, you know, one of their members to be saved. So, I mean, that's what I would guess it's referring to, like referring to, you know, their, you know, Orthodox faith and not, you know, doubting it or like falling from it, you know, in this situation. You know, that's what's coming to my mind as of right now. 
Well, this, uh, this second sentence of the creed is declaring that you must believe the following in order to be saved. Uh, the other creeds, uh, they're, not, they're not really trying to even address the subject of salvation in those creeds. The Apostles' Creed, by the way, a lot of people, there's a, like a legend that the Apostles' Creed is each one of the 12 apostles contributed one line in the creed. And if that's what you think, then I'm sorry, it's, it's, uh, uh, there's nothing historically that can support that or prove it. And just think about it. Do you really think each apostle would, would just say one line and then an apostle, another apostle says another line? It's, the whole thought of it being written that way is absolutely absurd. So, but we did discuss the Apostles' Creed and then the, the Nicene Creed 325. The Nicene Creed 325 was the first one to uh, establish this, uh, the, the deity of Christ and the fact that he's eternal and equal to the Father. Um, and then, uh, but they don't really address the subject of salvation. The same thing with the uh, uh, second Nicene Creed in 381 AD in Constantinople. The purpose of all these creeds are not to address the, the question of salvation. Why is that? Because the question of salvation among these believers who are made up of, of um, uh, priests, um, deacons, and bishops, <laughs> sound familiar? Priests, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and the, uh, the these people, even though they've come from cities around the Roman Empire to form what's called an ecumenical council, a worldwide uh, council from uh, people gathering around the whole Roman Empire to participate, uh, but they didn't have to discuss salvation because it was already pretty much standard. No one was arguing about what salvation was. Salvation was you get water baptized and and you get uh, and you receive the sacraments. That's the that's the error that entered in right right off the bat in the second, third centuries. So it was so common that it wasn't in dispute. The reason they had the Council of Nicaea in Constantinople was not to there was no question, no challenging over what salvation was. It, the challenge was the deity of Christ. Is he a creature or is he God? Uh, and uh, and the Godhead, uh, the triunity of God. That's why those creeds were written. Now, in this creed here, it's the first time that I've seen anything that declares this is what you've got to believe in order to be saved. Um, so, but as, as uh, Brother Stephen, you, you mentioned that uh, what the Bible says, what, what we get from the Bible about salvation is totally different than what you get from Roman Catholicism or even broadly general Catholicism in the first few centuries of the church. And as I said, they were teaching baptismal regeneration and, and take your, participating in sacraments to keep your salvation. Uh, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says salvation comes by faith alone, in Christ alone. Salvation is a free gift, uh, not by any works that we do. So uh, um, now let's see what this Athanasian Creed. Well, well first of all, let me ask you, do, does that surprise you when I said that the first few centuries of the church, they were the, the, um, the arguments, the councils and the creeds were, were all addressing the Godhead, not salvation. Does that surprise you at all? No, not really, because, I mean, looking at, like, a lot of stuff we covered in early church history, there was a lot of, you know, as we, we already mentioned this, you know, movements that really, you know, challenged the deity or would really confuse it. Like, of course, we'll say that Jesus was either, you know, a human fully or whether he was, you know, fully God and couldn't be human or whether, you know, it was... You know, there's no such thing, you know, as the Trinity, the how he, you know, it's modalism. He's just switching forms. You know, there's like so much going on. So, I mean, there, it's definitely had to be important, you know, to be able to, you know, create this to, um, you know, address that issue. But, yeah, it's also, you know, critically wrong, you know, with all of these traditions they were, you know, doing at the time, like, you know, like the baptism or in the sacraments, you know, for salvation. Of course, they even went as far as selling indulgences, you know, practically saying you have to pay for your salvation and you get it. So, I mean, the Catholics did a lot of things. 
when it came to salvation, like just completely getting it wrong. And like literally violating everything that was supposed, that's how it's supposed to be. So, I mean, yeah. And this is the first um, creed. Yeah, you're right. That I can remember where they're actually coming out and actually saying, this is how you, you know, get saved, or this is what you have to be doing because the others didn't address that at all. So I'm looking forward to seeing what it says next. Okay, let's continue on. Um, it says, and the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity uh, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. Um, let me just ask you to respond to that statement there. I'll read it again. That we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. Yep, and now, as we were just talking, now it jumps right back into, you know, like, you know, the Godhead, you know, the Trinity, and I guess talking about, you know, the importance of, you know, God the Father, God the Son, you know, and God the Holy Spirit, how, you know, like, they're three, but yet they're, like, also one, and, you know, all eternal, you know, and nothing was just, you know, just like, you know, man-made, that, you know, it's all, you know, God. So, I mean, because it's just basically a response, I would say, to most of those movements that were going on at the time. Well, I, uh, I researched to try to find when the Athanasian Creed was written, and I couldn't really uh, find anything that, that declared it as a, a statement of fact. Uh, it really, uh, uh, the, the, what I just read here uh, in the introduction was that it started showing up in the 6th century, so that would be the, five, the year 500 AD and, and beyond. Um, but it was... The Athanasius is the one that is um, attributed for either writing it or, I guess, if he didn't write it, teaching these these basic uh, tenets. And uh, he, I think, lived, let me see if, I think I can find that here on this uh, real quick, Athanasius. Um, Let me see. Uh, I don't see the date for Athanasia. Um, I think he lived in the fourth century, uh, around in the 300 and something. I'm pretty sure, but uh, let me. Um, okay, so it says this is established that God is a Trinity. Now we haven't seen the word Trinity in any previous creeds. So now we're seeing the word Trinity for the first time. Now, we, uh, we know that there's a Trinity or a triunity of the Godhead just by studying the scriptures, we have to deduce that because the Bible tells us there's one God. It says, Jesus is God, the Father's God, the Holy Spirit's God. Uh, so how do you explain that? Uh, well, you can say um, it's three persons, but yet one God, all the same substance, but three distinct persons. Um, or, or you could say like the modalists do, there's one God and he just changes masks. Sometimes he, you see him as Jesus. Sometimes you see him as the father. Sometimes you see him as the son in the scriptures, but it's the same person. That's modalism or Sabellianism. And this is part of the reason the creed was written to uh, differentiate itself from modalism. So now we get the concept of the Trinity. I, I hold to the Trinitarian um, uh, viewpoint of the Godhead. And now I know people, I've met people on YouTube that are modalists. And I personally feel that modalism is acceptable to me. Even though I don't hold to modalism, I know that there are a lot of verses I see in the scriptures. The modalists can say, see, see that? Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So they use verses like that and many others to support modalism. Uh, God was manifest in the flesh. 
In other words, manifest, that's what a mood is. He, he manifests either as the Father or he manifests as the Son or he manifests in the, as the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of things that could support modalism, but it was pretty much declared uh, heretical uh, and, and this <clears throat> concept of the Trinity or the triunity of God is orthodox. I happen to agree with the triunity or tr Trinitarian Godhead uh, because um, I see too many cases in the Bible where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all, all together having a conversation. I mean, so uh, I, I think that there's um, good reason to, to think that when Jesus is on the cross and saying, uh, Father, why have you forsaken me? He, why would he say that if he's just talking to himself? Uh, you know, I think example, there's many examples like that. Uh, but so there, I have reasons for not accepting modalism for my own belief, but I don't shun a modalist because they do agree that Jesus is eternal God almighty. And that, that is, that's basically good enough for me. Now, there are people I know that, that would say you're too liberal on that. You're too lenient. Uh, brother, how, what, how do you see the Godhead? Is it tr Trinity? I'm assuming you probably do. Yeah, I've always seen the Godhead as the Trinity. I mean, that's how, you know, I've always known it. But yet, you know, you see, you know, so many, you know, circumstances, you know, in the Bible. Now, I mean, you mentioned some that, you know, modalists could interpret, you know, as, you know, them being, you know, one. But then there's also ones, you know, where, you know, there's, you know, Jesus is, you know, talking to the Father, you know, and then, you know, like, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, falling. And then, of course, seeing, you know, the Father, you know, and Jesus at his right hand. So, I mean, I hold that there's a trinity. And, you know, that's, for now, that's not going to change anytime soon. Because I feel like I see a lot of, you know, evidence, you know, too much for that. For that. But I do see, you know, how modalists could, you know, see things as they do. Well, the arguing between uh, Sabellianism or slash modalism versus uh, uh, Trinitarianism versus uh, um, Arianism, uh, it's been really interesting studying all their different opinions, and, and, and uh, it, they really get quite uh, detailed in their arguments. Uh, but to me, uh, what offends me is if someone says Jesus is not eternal because if he's not eternal then he can't be god and if he's not god he can't be savior so that's why the deity of christ is essential and uh, now is he is he is he deity in the sense that that he's one of the three persons of the godhead uh, but he's eternal, not made, not created? Or is he deity in this respect that he is the God Almighty that changes forms? Um, I'm not going to shun someone over a disagreement over that, but I know that many people think that's more important than I do. Uh, but these points I brought up, you're going to see that these are all stated in this creed. They're trying to clarify this and kind of ratchet it down so that there's no way of escaping it. No, you can't be a modalist. No, you can't be an Arian. Okay, so let's continue reading. It says, uh, um, "It says not neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence." Now, the word "essence" uh, is a word that um, uh, uh, it, it, some people use the word "substance." Sometimes the, the word "essence," but it's saying that they're the same substance. They're, so therefore, they're equally God. Um, uh, and uh, so trying to explain and understand how you can have distinct persons and yet they're the one of essence of one essence of the essence of god that's the challenge and that's what they're trying to, to define here it says for there is one person of the father another of the son and another of the holy ghost but the godhead of the father of the son and of the holy ghost is all one the glory equal the majesty co-eternal. Uh, now, I think that the two things that are really important to understand here for the, that I, I think are, are essential is that they're all eternal and that they're all equal in glory. What's your response? 
Yeah, they do. Like they do state that very, you know, explicitly. And that's, you know, a huge, you know, importance because, you know, clearly talking about, you know, like the deity, you know, of Christ, but yet, you know, clearly, you know, distinguishing them, you know, as, you know, three here, like they're being very clear on this. It's three, but yet one, but yet, you know, all eternal, all sharing, you know, in glory. So you know, when you bring out, you know, the three, it's, you know, it's really, I get, as you said, it's aiming to, you know, swat aside, you know, modalists, you know, in this situation. It's trying to establish that as their, you know, Catholic doctrine. Yeah, this is, this is very refined, uh, the way they are defining everything. And just think about it. If this was written around 500 BC, I mean AD, which which I'm just guessing, because I said I can't find anything that proves the exact date, but let's say that it was written around 500 AD, and the last apostle has, was deceased around 100 AD. So, 400 years after the apostles had all died away, uh, and the New Testament was all written by the end of the first century too. So, 400 years later, they get around to de trying to define the Godhead in this way. Uh, it was not that they got around to it, but th it was debated all, at all these councils. That's the whole purpose of the councils, because people were um, uh, teaching the go uh, Godhead differently, and they wanted to uh, find an orthodox uh, standard uh, way of saying it. And uh, they really get very detailed here. So it says... Um, such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. Now, see, this is one of the main differences with, with the Athanasian Creed and the, the uh, Nicene Creed, is that they're really going to be saying the same thing about the Holy Spirit now. The Holy Spirit was pretty much neglected in the Nicene Creeds. He's mentioned, but he's not given the same kind of attention that uh, the Nicene Grave gave to the Son. So it says... Uh, um, it says, um, such as, as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Ghost, the Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Ghost uncreated. All right, so uh, that is that is something I'm adamant about myself. I mean, it, 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 God has to be uncreated. Otherwise, he's not God. He's a creature. And, you know, I, I've, I give more attention to focus on who Jesus is, but that's what they did the few first centuries. Now they're addressing the same kind of problem and discussion about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, God's, the Father is eternal, but don't think that God the Father created the Son and created the Holy Spirit. No, they're all co-eternal. What's your re reaction to that? Yes, they are. And... You know, it's very big to, you know, mention that because otherwise you're just, you know, as you said, you're just calling them, you know, a creature, you know, a creation. And you're, you know, in a sense, just, you know, denying their deity if you don't, you know, acknowledge them as eternal. Okay, let me continue. It says, um, the Father, unlimited, the Son, unlimited, and the Holy Ghost, unlimited. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet, they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also, there are not three uncreated, nor three infinites, but one created and one infinite. So they're really, <laughs> they're really, uh, getting very, very detailed because all these things, Every point in there really is answering an argument, saying that uh, some faction of the church teaching that uh, one part of the Godhead was not infinite. You know, it came later, or it was not uh, um, equal, or it's subordinate. Uh, so they really, uh, they're really stating that, no, that each one of them are equal in all these respects, and yet it, they're all still one. That's a, you see, they're, they're being so precise and, and, and really very um, uh, 
they're trying to cover every all the bases and but have you ever tried to explain that that the trinity the godhead to somebody if if anybody watching this video now if you were going to try to explain christianity the the the, the person of the of god that there's one god the father's god the son's god the holy spirit's god yet one god how are you going to explain that it's hard to explain and that's why a lot of people just throw up their hands and don't try to explain it they just instead say it's a mystery but they were trying to unveil the mystery so we can understand and also uh, argue uh, make it impossible that you could go into error thinking that that uh, Jesus or the Holy Spirit were created okay uh, before I go on do you have anything to say about that not too much but as I said it's just very you know important to you know address this topic you know about them not being you know created and then of course you know in the essence being one but always being eternal and always you know being you know sharing in glory that's all that's been a big thing and i mean as we've said a lot of the you know creeds have really you know gone into detail but not so much on like the um as we said this is the first time they've mentioned the trinity but like they're just really going into detail on this okay let me continue on then it says um so likewise the father is almighty the son almighty and the holy ghost almighty and yet they are not three almighties but one almighty so the father is god the son is god and the holy ghost is god and yet they are not three gods but one god so likewise the father is lord the son lord and the holy ghost lord and yet not three lords but one lord uh, for for like uh, for like as we are compelled by the cr Christian verity that means truth uh, to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords the Father is made of none neither created nor begotten the Son is of the Father alone not made not created but begotten. The Holy Ghost is the Father, is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Uh, these are, we're, we're getting to a couple of points here that were uh, the idea of being begotten and proceeding as is uh, being mentioned. I'll explain why. But what's your reaction to that part? Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, it's just really going into like the detail on them being you know three but yet at the same time it's not polytheism you know it's one you know not three lords you know but one lord so it's just really you know emphasizing the importance of you know the godhead you know being you know one god but then you know there's these three you know forms we know of you know father son you know and holy spirit and of course, again, just talking about, you know, how mighty, everlasting and glorious, you know, God is in the Godhead. Well, um, the idea of being begotten. Now, we know that the Bible says Jesus is the only begotten son. And so you're a son of God and I'm a son of God, but not in the way that Jesus is. Uh, you're an adopted son. I'm adopted. But Jesus is not adopted. That's what the era of adoptionism was teaching, that Jesus was adopted uh, because he, he, he lived such a perfect life that he became adopted and rose to a, a level of, of like a lesser God, not, not eternal God, but a, a man who did so well he became a God. That's adoptionism. Um, but so the Bible says that we are adopted as sons of God Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Now, this word begotten, though, that's the term that Arius jumped all over because he's, he's saying if, you, if you're begotten, you had to have a beginning. You're not eternal. So that's why in these creeds here, they use the, the term eternally begotten. Even though he's begotten, he's eternally begotten, he, and which I don't know what that means because to me, eternally begotten seems to be like an oxymoron. 
uh, two mutually exclusive words that can't go together. Um, I, the way I see Jesus as begotten really is, is, is his incarnation. I, I think that's what the begotten part of Jesus is. Um, but the, um, he's the only one that where God became a man incarnate in that way he's begotten. But the way that they're trying to solve the begotten problem is, is in terms of his deity rather than his humanity. So that's where I, I see the problem, but using the word that, so let me, before I go on to um, proceeding, the word proceeding, let me get your reaction to the begotten point. Yes, because, well, we know Jesus is eternal. You know, as he said, you know, before Abraham was, you know, I am. And of course he said that, you know, that he and his father are one, you know, it's always been throughout eternity. I know it can be sometimes, it's mind boggling to be able to think about that, you know, having, you know, no beginning. Because, you know, us as humans, you know, we have a set start and a set end, at least for our physical time, you know, here on this earth. So, I mean, it's just, it's just tough to think in that type of a scope, but yet we know it's true, you know, that Jesus, you know, came, and that he was eternal. But it is interesting that they're referring to his begotten, you know, as his, like when he first, you know, appeared as a man here. That's a, that's a very, you know, interesting statement, but... Right now, I'm still having a lot of thoughts, so I want let's let's see what happens. Well, when you say they they say that um, you might have misunderstood. That's how I see the begotten. They don't see the begotten that way. They say he is eternally begotten, and I'm saying I don't understand how you can say eternally begotten. It seems like the two words that contradict each other. If you're eternal, how could you be begotten? If you're begotten, how can you be eternal? That was an Arian argument. That's why Arianism came about because they didn't couldn't accept this eternally begotten. Uh, they thought begotten had that you had to be a creature. But I'm saying he was begotten at the at his conception, at his incarnation. Uh, but let's go on. Okay. Um, Let me see, where was I? Oh, yeah, proceeding. Um, there's a word proceeding here uh, that they originally said that Jesus, the Holy Spirit proceeded out of the Father. Uh, but then by the time we get to this creed, uh, it says he proceeds out of both the Father and the Son. Uh, let me see where it said the word proceed. Okay, yeah, it says, The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Uh, so uh, in the earlier creeds, it says that the Father, uh, the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father. And I think in this creed, it's going to say that he proceeds both out of the Father and the Son. So it says, so there is one Father, not three fathers. One Son, not three sons. One Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal. So that in all things, as foreset, as, as aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, uh, that will be saved. Let him thus think of the Trinity. Um, I really like uh, how this is done, um, even though I've, I've told you about my complaints about these creeds, and I think we're going to, the remainder of it, I may have an issue, may have an issue but uh, they certainly nail it down so that they're, you're seeing that all are co-eternal, all are co-equal, and yet there's one God. Uh, anything before I go on? I don't really think there's too much else to be said at this point. I mean, I think we've covered it pretty well about how they talk about the importance of the Trinity. So I want to see, you know, what they say when it regards to, um, like, faith later, if we get to that. Okay. Okay, so now it says, furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the essence of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man, the essence of the, his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who, although he is God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ, one not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by assumption of the manhood by God. One altogether, not by confusion of essence, but by unity of person. Uh, as for, the, for as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Now, I, this part here, I really, really like this statement. I was, I'm going to talk more about this when we're done. It says, for as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, uh, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again on the third day uh, from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead, uh, at whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their works. Well, before I get on to this last part here, let me get your reaction to this. They're, now they're addressing the problem of his humanity because that was another problem, as we talked about earlier, uh, you had another group of people, the Gnostics and the Docetists, that said the material world is evil, and therefore Jesus could not had had, had any material um, had any matter. Uh, he had to be totally spiritual, not not physical, uh, because the, everything in the physical world is evil. So they thought that he he uh, it was just an illusion, him being a. a a physical fleshly body but the problem with that is that uh if he didn't have a body then he didn't die for our sins and he wasn't bodily resurrected <laughs> there's the problem there so he has to have this humanity also and uh so this last part of the creed there is is talking about first we talked about the equality of the father the son and the holy spirit and all those different ways and now we're talking about uh, in addition to that, Jesus has humanity. And uh, so let me get your reaction to that. Oh, there I am. Um, yeah, like, I don't typically remember too much of the earlier creeds really going into detail, at least not the ones I was here for, you know, about Jesus being, you know, fully man, fully God. All right, I know... I guess I've had slight, you know, short-term memory loss. So I don't remember everything that you know was just said, but it seemed like it really was, you know, very, you know, much trying to go into detail, you know, on the subject of him being, you know, fully man, and yet at the same time, you know, fully God. Now the now I have we haven't heard anything that I can recall about, you know, the sacrifice that he died on the cross was very rose again. Just I don't remember hearing that yet. Maybe it's sat there and we haven't just got to it yet, or maybe you just said it and I don't remember. But, of course, that's what I feel like is the most important thing. Because I also heard about, you know, being judged according to works. So that's what made me, you know, think about that. But let's hear what you have to say as you dissect this. Okay. It, it does cite the gospel in terms of uh, stating these things are facts. And you need to believe these things. It says... Uh, he suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Uh, so it does mention those things. But my question is, is believing those things what saves us? And I'll answer the question myself. Uh, I, I've, I've said this over and over again, but... Uh, I can name 1.2 billion people in the world that believe that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried on the third day. He rose from the dead. They say, yes, I believe that's true. But then if you ask them, do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? 
their their salvation is not based on that. They say, well, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. And I go to church and I went to confession and communion and I take the communion and I do this and I do that. Their, their faith is in their religious works rather than in his sacrifice for our sins. So um, even though this is in the creed, they're not using that as the, uh, as the criteria to determine one's salvation. Um, so now let me read the final part here too. To, it'll, it'll make that point further. It says, um, it says, at whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their works and they, and they that have done good shall go into life everlasting and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe truly and firmly, he cannot be saved. Uh, so it says, if you do good, you get everlasting life. If you do evil, you get everlasting fire. Now, that's, it says that's what you have to, that's how, how you get saved. So uh, what's your reaction to that? Mm. To me, just to me, hearing that last part puts up a big red flag to me. Because then it's talking about those who do good versus those who do evil. It sounds like it's talking about works there saying that like those who do good works i'll make it move my camera up here they're the ones who are going to heaven and then the ones who apparently do evil works are going to hell according to you know just the last line that i've heard although it does mention you know jesus's you know what he went through it's it's like as you said a lot of catholics i guess might adhere to that line to you know an extent you know trusting in their own sacraments and their traditions rather than trusting on Jesus himself for salvation. You know, like, like they believe it happened, but they're not trusting him. And, you know, that's a big problem. Well, you, you didn't uh, say emphatically that they're uh, doing good meant doing good works, but it, it does actually say that in the creed. Let me read it again. It says, um, at whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their own works. And they that have done good shall go into life everlasting, and then that they have done evil into everlasting fire. Uh, and it says, uh, this is the Catholic faith with which except a man believe truly and firmly cannot be saved. So you've got to believe in salvation by works, according to this creed. And that's a big problem. That's a damnable, damnable heresy that sends people to hell. We're going to talk about how you get saved in a minute, but um, let me ask you to give a summary of the creed, your reaction to it, and, and uh, then I want to ask you to also have a follow-up question for you. Well, it starts off, you know, as we were talking about, really, you know, going into the subject, you know, of the Godhead, of the Trinity, and as we both liked how it, you know, was getting, you know, very, you know, on point and trying to be very specific about, you know, and just very, you know, thorough. But then you go to the very end and I just feel, and my pain just ruins the entire thing because now you're talking about salvation by works and not by believing on Jesus. Because, I mean, now it's like, to me, all I think about is, you know, all right, then what was the point of him suffering if it's just about, you know, your works? He came to pay the sacrifice for us that we could have the gift of everlasting life. So, and then saying that, you know, to be saved, you have to believe this. To me, it's just, it's a heresy in my opinion, especially the last line. Yeah, I mean, why doesn't this creed have Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 in it? Uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's salvation according to the Bible. Um, now, when it says that uh, those that do good go into everlasting life and those that do evil go into everlasting fire, there is a verse in the Bible that actually says that. I read it in John, probably chapter 4 or 5. But uh, it, the, the only way of understanding it correctly that fits with, with what salvation is, is that if you do good, what is doing good? Doing good is trusting Jesus. Uh, what is doing evil? Rejecting Jesus. Um but they don't present it that way. They connect it to works. If you do good works, um, if you do the will of the Father, 
you go to heaven. If you don't do the will of the Father, you go into everlasting fire. But the what what is the will of the Father? Well, in John it says the will of the Father is that you believe in the Son. So if you want to do good, believe in the Son. If you want to do the will of the Father, believe in uh, believe in the Son. And uh, that's really the only the only good and <laughs> thing that you can do that will justify you before God. Now, I want to ask you for a if you can think of any kind of illustration to illustrate what the Godhead is. Uh, you know how people will use the various types of examples and say it's like this. Have you heard of any? Do, you, do any come to mind? I mean. I've heard a few, you know, every night, like, as time, you know, through the years. I think the biggest one I've probably heard is the water one, where they say that, like, ice, you know, get gas and, you know, liquid. Like, I've heard that, you know, analogy before when it comes to, like, you know, Father, you know, like, I guess being liquid, you know, the sun being ice and the Holy Spirit being the vapor, but yet it's one substance. I mean, I've heard that one before, but... Like, for me, it would be, I took, I guess, like, when it comes to giving an illustration, probably not something that I ever have really thought about giving one before. Like, what do you say? Well, first, let me respond to your example there. That is probably the most common example that people use trying to illustrate the Trinity. But, uh, but this, uh, uh, Athanasian Creed here, this um, um, and the other creeds, they, they they would argue. Wait, that's I, we can't accept that. That's that's modalism. Modalism means that you have um, one substance just changes into three different modes or three different uh, uh, manifestations. So water can change into, uh, I mean, ice. Let's take ice. You have ice. It's H2O. That's the substance. And But if it, if it melts, it's water. It's changed into another. It's manifests itself as water, but it's still H2O. And then the water, if it's boiled and heats, it turns into vapor, and, and, uh, but it's still H2O. But that's not triunity see modalism and sabellianism which is this creed is meant to argue against and debunk a modalism says that he only operates in one mode at a time ice is not vapor ice is not water it's ice i mean ice is not liquid i should say uh, water liquid water is not ice unless it is frozen then it changes into ice Water, H2O liquid, is not vapor unless it changes into vapor. And that's what modalism, it, God, God, there's one God, he just changes into different, three different modes of, of operating, of, of interacting. Um, it, some people say it's like putting on a mask. So you have Jesus, let's say Jesus, that's why they call it the uh, Jesus only doctrine. Uh, G, only Jesus is God. It's just that sometimes he puts on a mask like he's the Father. And then sometimes Jesus puts on a mask like he's the Holy Spirit. But it's still Jesus is all, th all three of them. And uh, that's modalism. So the example of water, ice, and vapor is not an example of tr Trinity because the Trinity says, no, it doesn't change from one to the other to the other. It's all three at the same time, yet one. And so... They, they gave part of the example in this creed that I thought was very good. It says here at the end, he said, uh, let me see. Okay, it says, uh, talking about his humanity, it says, who although he is God and man, yet he is not two, but one in Christ. So, um, oh no, it's right here. It goes on, it says, for as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. So it says, it, like, uh, if you have a man, he's a soul and he's also flesh, and yet he's one man. 
that's closer. That's part of the example I would give. I've always said the best way of understanding the Godhead is what it says in Genesis one, chapter one. It says that uh, let us make man in our image. Uh, this is giving us a, a clue that God is not singular, but plural. It doesn't say, I will make man in my image. It said, let us make man in our image. So we get an indication there's some kind of plurality going on with God. So if man is made in God's image, what is man? Uh, man is triune. Here I have Brother Luke's body. That's me. But I also have Brother Luke's mind, soul. That's, that's me, my consciousness, my thoughts. Uh, um, and, th and, then, and then we have Brother Luke's sp Holy Spirit connected to the Holy Spirit, my spirit. So the, my spirit is Luke. My soul is Luke. My body is Luke. There, but there's really only one Luke. So that to me is the only, the closest thing I've seen that actually shows there's three simultaneously yet one. Whereas in modalism, there's three, but only one at a time. You see the difference? Yeah. I like, I do like that, you know, explanation, but I was just saying the one I gave you was just one that I've just said that I've heard before. <laughs> Don't don't be defensive. <laughs> I'm just I'm just explaining it to you. Um, now, uh, I guess that's um, that's enough of the Athanasian Creed. Now we we're talking about the problem with this creed, and the problem with all these creeds is they either neglect salvation, or uh, the previous creeds we talked about they say you're saved by baptism. So they, they either neglect it or say your baptism saves you, or in this case. It's uh, you'll be judged by your your works, and if you do good, you go to heaven. If you do bad, you go to hell. So it's it's a false message of salvation. So what is the real message of salvation if we're not saved by doing good works or getting water baptized, brother? Uh, my favorite part of the night every time. All right, everybody. Let's say listen in. Oh, brother Luke just put up his uh, profile picture, which. Hopefully he'll keep up after this, which will talk about the importance of, you know, trusting on Jesus. But as usual, I'll start off reading you know, my favorite, you know, verse of the gospel, which is, which translate to good news. Although, of course, in our case, it's not just good news. It's amazing news because it's the best news you could ever receive because it completely changes your eternity. You know, so that way you can have it forever in heaven and forever, you know, with God. As it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth of him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, the eternal God, you know, came here in the form of man, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, fully man, fully God. Now, when he was here, he died, was buried and rose again to pay for our sins. And why did he do that, though? He did that because we can't do it on our own. You know, as it says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. As it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter what we do, you know, we're never going to be able to achieve righteousness on our own. We'll never be able to be good enough on our own. Like we cannot pay for our, we cannot pay our own way. Let's just put it that way. Because any sacrifice we try to make on our own, it's always going to come up short. Because we're not righteous and we can't do it. But Jesus did it for us. You know, for as it says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of, as it says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, we're born sinners with our eternal destination being death. But Jesus gives us a gift of eternal life. Not having to, he came here in the flesh you know, being the eternal God, and not only was he, you know, sinless, perfect, and performed many miracles and pleasing to his father, but he died for us. He shed his blood and put all the sin in the world on him. 
you know, he paid the price for us. And then, of course, he proved who he was three days later because he was buried. And then three days later, he rose again, you know, proving that, he, that who he was, that he was, you know, God, and that he had the power to take back life, as he said. But you know, the significance I really think about is what he did on the cross, you know, by, you know, putting all the sins of the world on him. And he did that because we couldn't do it. And he and because of that, he offers us the gift of everlasting life because he's paid for it. You know, we can't pay for it. So he did. And how do we get that gift? Well, as it says in John 6, 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You know, this is Jesus talking. I know it also says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I love that because it just makes it so simple. You know, Jesus paid it all for us, you know, for you. And all he asks is that we believe on him to receive the everlasting gift of salvation. You know, as it, as it says, you know, we even talked about this tonight in John 6, 29. This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. No good works will ever get you into heaven. Only by having faith and trust in Jesus alone. Because he paid it all because we couldn't. But another important thing for me to mention before I, you know, end this is John 10, 28. He said, and Jesus said, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And I like to add the word ever. Because once you've been saved, you're saved and you're saved forever. Let's say you're in the body of Christ, you're saved and you can never lose your salvation. Because, you know, Jesus has already paid for it all for you. And he said that you have everlasting life and that you are passed from death into life. He didn't say you have temporary life, but everlasting because he paid it all. And that's the invitation I give on you know, everybody here tonight, that you believe on Jesus and live. Just come to him. You know, stop trying. Like, don't focus on your own works to save you. I'm not speaking out against, you know, doing, you know, good works, but don't trust in them to save you. Only what Jesus did can save you because he paid it all on the cross. So that's my invitation to you tonight. Come to Jesus and live. And that's all I have. Oh, okay. Very good. Um, so I hope everybody understands how simple and easy it is to be saved. Uh, all you've got to really do is uh, receive salvation as a gift. The Bible says that um, the good news is Jesus is offering you eternal life in heaven as a free gift. That should make you happy. Uh, and you receive the gift simply by trusting Jesus. It's like this uh, icon here. Oops, wrong there. Yeah, that's a picture of trusting Jesus. Jesus wants to take you to heaven. Just reach out, embrace him, and trust him to get you to heaven. Uh, You've got to accept the idea that uh, uh, it's impossible to get to heaven through uh, your own goodness, through your own religious works. It, that's impossible. And instead, uh, trust Jesus and he'll do it for you. And once you do trust him, you're guaranteed. Uh, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. All right. Thank you for watching. Uh, Brother Stephen, thanks for participating. And please join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.